All right, well, I want to thank everybody for coming to my talk. I uh, hope you guys can all hear me OK. I know it's sort of getting later in the day, closer to the end of the day. So I appreciate everybody for coming here and, and, and for joining me and talking about vector search and vector databases more broadly. Uh, before I dive into the meat of this talk, I do want to get a quick show of hands how many of us are familiar with vector search with vector databases more broadly. OK, so quite a few, quite a few. And I imagine everything, you know, the whole hype around LLMs and around ChatGPT, I, I imagine it certainly helped. But what Milvis is and, you know, what I hope you take away from this particular talk is why we need a vector database that's really, really scalable. Why do we need something that supports billion scale, high performance, has a lot of production readiness built into it? And how do we build that? How do we build that? Why is it difficult to build that into a vector database? And why do we need to build something from the ground up to support vectors? I know there's been a lot of other great talks today that mention vector databases. A lot of them talk, dive deep into some of the nitty gritty when it comes to vector search. This one's going to be more about Milvis itself. It's going to be more about the architecture more about how we built it, the evolution from Milvis 1, 1.1 to 2.0, 2.1 and 2.2, and where we are today, right? Where do we see vector search and vector databases more broadly going in the future? So without further ado, I'll, I'll get started. My name is Frank, Director of Operations, Head of ANML here at Zillas. And Zillas, we are the company behind Milvis. Milvis is the world's most widely adopted open source vector database. It's got something like 25,000 stars on GitHub. You can go download it, play around with it as you see fit. And really, if you look at our company, we've been doing vector search. We've been building out vector search technology and vector databases since 2018, actually. So Zillas has been around since 2017. We're based in Redwood Shores, so just a 30, 45, well, 40, 40, 40 to 50 minute drive uh, up 101, I would say, depending on whether or not there's traffic. And we're the key maintainer of a variety of open source projects the most critical and the most well-known of which is Milvis that you see on the left over there. So before I talk too much about Milvis, before I dive into some of the details around that, I'm gonna give a quick recap of vector search and why is it so powerful? Why should you care about vectors? And why should you care about vector search? And really, if we look at it, vectors are a great way to represent unstructured data. And unstructured data is everywhere, right? I think if you look, Way back in you know, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when computers were first around, one of the key things that they were good, and one of the key things that they were built to do is store, index, and search a large quantity of data. And back then, a lot of data was structured. You know, it was in relational, relational databases and these tabular databases, and there was a lot of format. There was a data model that was associated with all the data that we could store. If you think of an employee database, for example, you could have Things like ID number, date of birth, name, address, those are all stored in individual columns in that relational database. But as we have moved into the mobile era, the IoT era, where data is coming in from a variety of different sources, we have image data, video data, so on and so forth, that is when we really come to see the need for a way to store, index, and search these large quantities of unstructured data. And whoops. And if we, if we really think about it, vectors are what unlock a lot of this unstructured data analysis for us. The way that we typically do it is you have a knowledge base or you have an internal set of, let's say, images, video, audio, or text, something that you want to index, something that you want to understand, and you use embedding models. You use deep learning models to turn those into vectors, and then you can store them inside of a vector database. And I know there are many other vector databases out there. We're obviously partial towards Zillas Cloud. We're obviously, we're obviously partial towards Milvis, but there's a, there's a variety of different ways that you can generate those embeddings and obviously many ways that you can store them as well. And really, the analogy that I like to use, what makes these vectors so incredibly powerful is that they really encode the semantics of your input data, depending on how your embedding model is trained. This is from the ImageBind paper, I think released maybe about half a year ago, uh, maybe a little bit sooner than that. And one of the really interesting things that you can see here is that you can do more than just search for nearest neighbor vectors. You can do cross-modality retrieval. So if you see in the upper left-hand corner there, if I have audio that I turn into a vector, and I have images and video that I turn into a vector, I can embed those in the same space, and they represent semantically things that can be very, very similar. So the crackle of a fire, if I retrieve related images and video, I get images of, let's say, you know, a bonfire or, or a fireplace, so on and so forth. 
I can do the same for, let's say, um, you know, modalities from text to images and potentially even text to molecules as well. It's not something that you typically think of as unstructured data. One of the other interesting things that we can do with vector search is embedding space arithmetic. Now, if we look in the lower left-hand corner there, we have, I'm not really sure what that is, like a pelican or a swan. Uh, and then if we add the sound of waves, right, so we embed both of these, we embed audio and images in the same space. And if we add these together and we retrieve in this vector database the most relevant pictures, the most relevant images, all of a sudden we get that same animal, except the backdrop is now a lake or the ocean or the beach, something. It's right, something that potentially has water or the sound of waves rushing through it. And that is the power of vector search. That is why I like to say that vector vectors are the languages of machines. And that's why I think everybody in this room should care about vectors and what they represent and what they're good for. They're great for a lot more than just text and a lot more than just retrieval augmented generation, even though that is what they are predominantly used for today. So you know, as, I just, as I just mentioned, retrieval augmented generation the ability to use a vector store in conjunction with a large language model, that is the way that it is used today. And uh, for, for folks who are not too familiar with vector search or vector databases, I apologize, I am jumping through things a bit quickly, but RAG is the predominant way that vector databases are used today. But if we look further into the future, if we look maybe two, three, five years down the road, Vector databases will be everywhere. Vector search will be everywhere. To a certain extent, you'll see them used alongside relational databases or NoSQL databases with equal ratio in different organizations. And the reason is, I'm gonna go back to this slide a little bit earlier, is because we have so much unstructured data and vector databases are clearly the best way, perhaps even the only way to store, index, and search all of the different types of unstructured data, right? So that's really where we're going. That's really where we're going. We're going from a predominantly RAG use case for vector databases today, all the way to things like video similarity search, recommendation, fraud detection, so on and so forth. They're, they're, they can be used for so much more than just retrieving the most relevant documents related to an input prompt for a large language model. So now we've, we've done, a, done a bit of a recap of sort of vector search, why it's important, why you should care about it. I wanna do a bit of a deep dive into Milvis. And you know, recently I think there's been, I think a lot of folks have been, are, are becoming more aware of what vector databases are and what vector search is as well. But I think for Milvis, we've been de developing it for a long time, since 2018. We've, de we've been developing it for five years, and a lot of people come up, to me, come up to me and ask, hey, I can build a vector database in a weekend, or I can build it you know, over two weeks, or maybe even a month, right? What makes Milvis so special? Why should I care about what you guys have built? Why should I use Milvis over, let's say, another vector database or some other options out there? And the first is, well, the first is that's not written on here. First is, it's open source. 100% Apache 2 licensed. Uh, it's a part of the Linux Foundation as well, specifically the LFAI Data Foundation. You can go onto GitHub if you Google Milvis. Uh, the GitHub link is probably the first one that, that, uh, that pops up or the Milvis website, right? It's open source. The second is that it is a distributed system. In particular, it is a distributed database. Now, what does that mean, right? You remember the title? I talked about billion scale. I talked about high performance. And if you want to do that, being a distributed system is 100% necessity. It gives you exceptional flexibility, gives you exceptional scalability, and it is the only way for you to be able to scale into many, many, many vectors so that you can, so your application can support, let's say, a variety of different modalities in whatever embedding space that you want to support. And at the same time, we have real-time read and write. It is not a batch, it is not a pure batch-based vector search solution. On top of that, we also give you the capability to add metadata to each vectors. We give you the capability to add scalar fields, and in the future, you will have the ability to build indexes over those scalar fields in addition to indexes over those, meta over those vector vectors as well. And we've done a lot of data-driven optimization inside of Milvis to give you the absolute best performance. So for example, right, we have separated the vector indexing, the core vector indexing and vector querying layer. It's called Nowhere, uh, N-O-W, H-E-R-E. -E. 
from Milvis itself. And that gives us the capability to say, okay, as new vector indexing and vector search algorithms come in, we can add that into nowhere and it can be automatically supported inside of Milvis. What that also gives us is the capability to, let's say, tailor the vector index, the vector search algorithm to your application needs. Now, if you want something that is very, very high throughput uh, at the cost of higher memory, you can use something like HNSW, um, or you can use, you know, there's a variety of different ones out there that you can pick and choose from. If you want something that has lower memory consumption, you can use, let's say, a quantization based, or you can use disk ANN that's also supported inside of Novus as well. And we also have the capability to do batch processing. So, so both batch and stream processing, if you look at bullet points two and four there, right? So that's really what makes Milvis unique. That's what makes Milvis different. And that is one of the reasons building out all these individual features is one of the reasons we've been doing it for so long is we want to provide everybody, right? Anybody who comes to our open source site, uh, who comes to our, our, our GitHub page, the capability to build these confidently in production at billion scale and at very, very high performance as well. And I want to talk very, very briefly about Milvis 1 to Milvis 2. I want to talk about how we've evolved the architecture and why we have done it the way that we have. Now, if you look at Milvis 1.0, released, I want to say, in 20, 2020, I believe it was, uh, you have all these different layers, and they are all in what you can essentially think of running a single machine, perhaps even as a single executable. There's a proxy layer, there's a storage layer, there's the index, and there's the querying, right? All of these are inside of a single machine. And now the storage layer in particular is talking to object storage. So if we have, so that we can actually store all those vectors and the raw data along with the metadata somewhere on S3 or somewhere on blob storage as well. We have these insertions and all these searches that are coming through as well, and all these are essentially hitting a single machine. You can do replication, but there is really a shared nothing architecture to Milvis 1.0. There's nothing that you can replicate across all these instances consistently. And what we have done in Milvis 2.0, hopefully this animation works right. I might have to do one more. There we go. What we've done in Milvis 2.0 is we've split all of these individual components it's now in a distributed system, right? The proxy layer is now split from the query nodes. And in particular, what you'll see is that we have individual nodes for each of the individual workloads that we want to do inside of our vector database. We have a query nodes or a query cluster to do the querying. We have index nodes which do the indexing, and we have data nodes which do the ingestion, the writes into our data and into object store, right? So Milvis 2.0, we've taken all of these individual components, obviously it's a little bit simplified, but we've taken all these individual components inside Milvis 1.0 and we've really split them out into a distributed system and that's what gives you the capability to scale as you see fit to get really, really high performance and to really take vector search to the next level. Now if we talk about the read and write paths, quote unquote, more so the insertion or the search paths, what happens is a search request will come through It'll hit the proxy first, and that goes directly to the query nodes. What resides on the query nodes is simply all of the vector indexes, and we'll talk a little bit more about specifically how that works at the data level. But you can just think of these requests for the time being. They'll come through the proxy. I apologize, it's spelled, spelled incorrect, incorrectly up there. But then they'll go to the query nodes, and the query nodes will return a result to the proxy, which, which will then return a result to the user. Right? That is the search path. If we talk about the insertion path, it's a little bit more complicated. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll see why it needs to be a little bit more complicated and how these, how basically having an insertions like this gives us really superior performance. First, the insertions will go through a log broker. Now it could be Kafka, it could be Pulsar, we're working on our own as well. And the idea is that this log, it can be, it's vectors are written into different channels in Kafka, and then they can be read out by query nodes or by data nodes. So for example, if we're doing ingestion, if we're doing insertion, the data nodes will actually read out the data from log sequence, and it will store all of these into the write ahead log, into our data and in index, into blob files, into S3, so on and so forth. Now, once I've accumulated enough data, enough data to, vector data, excuse me, I've accumulated enough da vector data to form what is called a segment, or a sealed segment, that will, get th that will then get sent to the index cluster. The index cluster will build, is responsible for building an index across that segment, and then it will write it back into S3. 
right? It'll write it back into our blob storage. Once that happens, the query nodes can then take that and they can, uh, oh, excuse me. As these segments are being filled, it will, the query nodes will actually read some, they'll actually read the most real-time data and do a brute force search over the most real-time ones. I'll get, to, I'll get a little bit more into the details of that in a second. And the index then, the, the built indexes, they also get loaded from S3, they get loaded from blob storage, and then into the query nodes, and the query nodes are able to do the searches as they see fit. So what does this give us, right? This gives us a very, very scalable distributed system. In particular, it gives us separate storage and compute. We can scale all of this as we see fit through Kubernetes via microservices. So each of those that you see over there is a microservice. And we have this idea inside of Milbus where log is data, right? Log is a single source of truth. And we can have all of that be basically we can have all of that ground a lot of our vector searches and so we can be confident in the results. This gives us these four points that you see up there. Scalability uh, gives us resource, uh, resource optimization. So if you want to have, if you have a very, very write heavy workload, you can scale up your data nodes and your index nodes and you can scale down your query cluster as well. It gives us isolation and it gives us pooling as well. So all of these are very, very critical and all of these are really traditional, let's say, database or database-y features that you would see in relational databases or NoSQL databases, but we have built them for vector search. We have made, we have put the database into vector search, right? That is the key thing to remember. And I won't talk too much about this, but it's helpful to know. So it gives a, a little bit of context into some of the stuff that I was talking about before is that we have these data structures inside of Milvus that really enable you to move the data around and to be able to do a lot of this optimization at large scale. So first thing is shards, right? Shards are specifically for the right path. And the right path, it, you know, if, we, if, if you increase the number of shards, you can boost the insertion rate. A segment is a single unit of vectors inside of Milvus. You can think of it like this, right? As I insert more vectors in my vector database, uh, I have a growing segment. Once that segment reaches a certain threshold, it becomes a sealed segment. That sealed segment is then sent to the index nodes, to the index cluster, to build an index over it, which will then get stored in S3 and also retrieved by the query nodes as well, All right? I do see some confused phases out there. So do we have any questions? before I go to the next slide. Okay, well, feel free to come up to me afterwards and ask anything that you guys would like, if there are any out there. And then there's also this process known as compaction, right? So as we build more and more segments, as we delete vectors from our vector database, some of these segments will become very, very small. They'll shrink in size. So there's a, there's a concept known as compaction where we'll take many, many small segments and we will merge all of them into a big one and re-index all of it, store it back in S3, give it back to the query cluster as well so that it can continue to perform searches, it can continue to perform queries as, as we see fit. So this is the high level, if we put all this together, this is the high level Movis architecture, right? We have object storage that lies at the very bottom we have those worker nodes that you see in the middle, and this is what, what I was talking about a little bit earlier, the query nodes, data nodes, and index nodes. And all of that is connected to message store, to either Kafka or to Pulsar, connected to this log broker. And log broker, for example, it will, what that does is it enables, it enables us to, you know, both the data nodes and the query nodes, they need to read vectors that are inserted, right, in real time. Query nodes need to do that because as I have growing segments, they are not indexed immediately and I need to be able to search those, right? At the very top, we have the coordinator service and that coordinator service you can think of as just the brains of the database, of our vector database, and it will control all the resources that you see in the worker nodes. It will control that worker layer. This is really the high level architecture and if there is one takeaway from this particular talk, it is how we have built this, why we have done a lot of the design decisions that we have for this particular architecture, right? So again, I'll leave this up here. Uh, I'll try to remember to leave this up here towards the end of the talk and feel free to ask any questions about it afterwards if you'd like. 
So I think I only have a couple minutes left. I'm actually at time right now, so I will I'll try to breeze through this pretty quickly. I'll try, try not to take any more than five minutes. So I want to talk very briefly about the future of vector search, and in particular, the future of vector databases as well. And I said earlier that the possibilities are endless. There are so many different applications that we can use out there. Right? So you'll see in the top left-hand corner that is one that we built, that is retrieval augmented generation over open source documentation. It's called OSS Chat. The one on the right, we also built that as well as molecular search. One of the very interesting applications of vector databases, in my opinion, where you can actually embed molecules into one standardized embedding space. And then you can search for, more, for most similar molecules to get, let's say, you know, if I want to tackle a particular symptom, or if I want to you know, minimize, let's say, some, some type of side effect. right? And then in the lower left-hand corner, that is a demo for reverse image search as well. So searching for existing images in my database using images that are already out there. All these are great examples of some of the things that you can do with vector search and with a vector database. And hopefully open, opens up your eyes towards the possibilities, right? It is great for more than just semantic text search. It is great for more than just retrieval of documents or document chunks using prompts that you guys have. But are we done, right? Now we've built this really, really scalable database. We can scale to a billion vectors, uh, you know, probably more than any organization out there needs. We just have to fix bugs and continue to, continue to uh, improve the, I guess, improve the performance and, and really minimize a lot of the kinks that are in the system, right? So are we done? And I think the answer is a resounding no. There's so much more out there that we have to think about. Vector databases, yes, they are a database at the end of the day, but also I would say, I would argue that they lie somewhere in the middle, somewhere in between AI ML as well as databases and data infrastructure. And we have to continue to catch up to where machine learning is today, right? So things like multimodal models, sparse vectors, so on and so forth. And just as a quick, well, as a quick sneak peek into some of the things that we're gonna be supporting very soon, we will be adding sparse vector support now, this is something I know that a lot of other vector databases have added. Uh, you know, it's, been, it's been out there for a while. Vespa, for example, has sparse vector support. But for us, I think we have sort of, w sparse vector support, we view it as something that is good, but not critical for vector search for vector databases, because again, it is good for multiple modalities and sparse vectors currently are used pr pr predominantly for text. We also have what we like to call multi-vector support. So if you have a single row in your database, you can associate multiple vectors with it, not just a single one. And then we'll be able to have the ability to build indexes over your metadata, over your scalar fields as well. That's gonna be important moving forward, especially as we do a lot more filtering. So I encourage everyone out there to go and start building with Mobus, right? Try it, try it. And we have three different versions. The first that you see on the left-hand side over there is what I like to call our embedded or our light version. You can just pip install it. Pip install Milvis, and then import Milvis, milvis.start, that's it. You've got a vector database up and running. You don't have to worry about anything. We have a bigger version called Milvis standalone. That's meant to run on a single machine, single instance, sort of like the MySQL of the good old days and give you really, really high performance vector search on a single machine, a single server, and then the big granddaddy of them all, Milvis Cluster, which uses that architecture that I showed a little bit earlier to give you really, really scalable vector search. Vector search at billion scale at very, very high performance, right? So wherever you are in your vector search journey, we have a version of Milvis that supports your use case and will be there with you. If you're just starting out, you wanna try, let's say 10,000, 100,000 vectors, embedded Milvis or Milvis Lite is a great option for you. If you have Let's say a million, maybe five million, 10 million Milvis standalone is maybe something that you wanna take a look at. And then as you scale, maybe you need 1,000 queries per second, 10,000 queries per, se per second. You need to support 10 billion vectors. That's when you want to try out Milvis cluster, or you can go to Zillow's cloud, and check out some of the stuff that we have on there as well. So that's it, right? And I know I am, I think I'm, oh, well, not too bad. So I think I have about five or six minutes for questions. Would love to take any questions right now if any of you guys have them, yes? Okay, so I'll go back to the architecture diagram here real quick. Give me one sec. So you said like this comes with the Milvis cluster. Now. Yes, so this architecture diagram is Milvis cluster, right? Correct, yeah. So the question is, does it have uh, 
an option of Kafka or Pulsar, yes, you can choose either Kafka or Pulsar. You don't have to use both. Um, the recommendation is, I think by default it comes with Kafka. Uh, Pulsar, the advantage that you get with Pulsar is that you can, I think the, there's less overhead when you open up a new topic. So you can, in theory, support more collections, but I would have to double check that. Yeah, great question. Anything else? Great question. So what the, the question here was, what is the typical chunk size when you create your vector embeddings? And that's, that is dependent on a couple of different things, right? So the first is your application. The second is what embedding model you're, you're, you're using. In, when you talk about chunk size, you're referring specifically to retrieval augmentation, to indexing documents, right? And the chunk size that you would want to use is, I'm not going to give you a very, very straight answer. It depends on, I would do some experimentation. Uh, and also, I would probably use one of the frameworks that are out there to do it. So either, either Llama uh, or Langchain. Um, and there's a couple of different retriever strategies as well where you can merge different chunks. Uh, you can split off different chunks and so on and so forth. But it is 100% constrained by the context window of your embedding model. I would say find, I would say a pretty good sweet spot is maybe one paragraph, right? Just make sure you have some overlap between your chunks. Great question. So the question here is, what is the typical delay be between when we have incoming data and when it is searchable? And this is actually a particular topic of Milvis that I didn't get into, which is we have different levels of consistency in Milvis. So there is strong consistency as well. If you choose strong consistency, you'll probably see, even with a very, very high, perform high, high performance vector index, you can probably see delays of you know, 100, maybe even a couple hundred milliseconds between when you do a query and when that's returned, right? If you do eventual consistency, uh, things should converge at max, I would say within a second, maybe a couple of seconds. So data that you insert won't be immediately searchable. But when you talk about vector search, when you talk about a vector database, because it is an inherently a stochastic database, right? Because vector indexes are not 100%, they don't, give, they don't have 100% recall, Typically, it's something like 95 to 99 percent if you're using HNSW uh, or disk ANN. That is why we say, you know, that is why we say we encourage most folks to just use eventual consistency, consistency excuse me, and not to worry about uh, a lot of those, uh, a lot of those other other effects. Yeah, another great question. So it depends on. First of all, it depends on how you define your schema. And I don't, without opening up a huge can of worms, typically a vector will only reside on one or the, a single vector will only reside on one of the query nodes unless you have replicas, unless you increase the number of replicas. So replicas, replica count in Milvis, that is for the read or the query path and shards are for the write path, right? If you have replicas, that is when you might have, that is when you can, let's say, boost the performance of your vector database, and that is when you potentially could have multiple vectors that reside in different query nodes. But if you have only, if, you know, if your replica number is one, and let's say you're trying to fetch a top K of 100, it will first, it will hit all those, the shards are distributed, not shards, excuse me, segments are distributed among the query nodes. And then each of the segments will have an index built over it. The query nodes will, will perform the search over each of those indexes and then agglomerate the results. Yeah, so the question here is, does it, is it distributed across regions? Uh, no, not natively, but I imagine you could, let's say potentially use something like Spanner or you could use another, uh, you, could, you could build it, you could distribute it, especially the, ob the especially the object storage and the worker nodes, those two layers in a way such that you could have it distributed across multiple regions. But natively outside of the box, it is not meant to, it is not meant to support multiple colos. I'm happy to take a couple more questions as well, but I, I am, you know, just to be cognizant of time, uh, I do wanna end, end this presentation here. I will leave this slide up 
if you guys want to, let's say, take a picture, uh, take a picture of it, ask more questions about it, use it as reference, so on and so forth. This is all. This information is also available in our documentation on milvis.io, and yeah, I look forward to uh, to chatting with any folks that have any lingering questions uh, after this. Thank you.